going to introduce our guest speaker for today's class before I can allow him to take over. I'm also very happy we have, uh, I have my colleague, um, I have my colleague, Justice Munyedia, with us here today. So our guest speaker is a gentleman that I would want to give a proper present, uh, introduction before he can start. He is one of the drafters that has done a very good job in this country in regard to legislative drafting. Now, Mr. Dima is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya post 15 years experience. Mr. Dima is currently the principal legal counsel and head of the delegated legislation attached to the Kenya National Assembly. He's formerly a state counsel where he was the drafting uh, senior drafter at the drafting department at the AG's chambers. Mr. Dima has done various legislative drafting courses, drafting at the University of London. He did a drafting, legislative drafting with Georgetown University, the United States of America, and also at Loxaba, New Delhi, and other institutions. Mr. Dima is an alumni of Moi University. Now, this afternoon, Mr. Dima has been kind enough to join us in the morning, and again, he's joining us now, the next two hours. His presentation is themed on three subtopics based on our course outline. Mm -hmm. He's going to spend a bit of time talking about amending legislation, then the panel provisions. So we'll spend a bit of time also talking about penalty provisions. If you're told to draft a penal provision, how do you go about it? And finally, time in legislation. Now, we will allow him to make his presentation. He prefers doing it in three, uh, actually one after another, amending legislation, then maybe questions, penalty provisions, questions, then time in legislation. So we'll allow him perhaps to do the first two presentations and we can take questions. Mr. Dima? Okay, uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can now hear you. You ready? Yeah, I'm just trying to get. I, I use. I'm trying to get you the slides. I'm okay. trying to get to post the slides. No problem. Let me give you five minutes. Yes, please. So let me allow my senior, just as Munyedia, just to address the three classes. Mr. Oh, Munyedia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Christine, for that introduction and for inviting me to join the afternoon class. Um, I have interacted with class C e and F where I teach trial. Maybe the other classes I may not have interacted with them. Uh, I just want to tell the students to be open-minded as we approach uh, this final leg of the term and more so the guest speakers who are coming. I'm aware that this afternoon, uh, you yesterday you were at Kiage and today we have Dima. Please ask as many questions as possible. Write them on the chat engage the speaker, ask all those questions you have seen on the past paper relating to the topic that we are going to discuss, and then uh, make this an interactive session uh, to take something home. I'm sure you may not want to know how to join parliament if you want to work or do peer pledge. Uh, Dima will be able, I'm sure, to answer those questions when you ask. But in the meantime, let's focus on understanding legislative drafting. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you, Justice. Uh, those are words of wisdom. We have exactly three weeks to wind up uh, the ATP 2020-2021 academic year. So I know these are very important lessons for the students. Now, I think I'll allow Mr. Dima to just take us through his presentation. It's now 2.35. We can have you proceed until around probably... 3.30, then we can take questions. Mr. Dima, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, uh, thank you very much. I think we lost him there for a minute, Mr. Dima.
work thing, but uh, I'm just trying. Sorry about that. Okay. It says I'm back. So this late. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everybody. Madam Christine, can you now see my slides? Uh, not yet, Mr. Dima. Now we can. Now we can. Now you I can think you're, now, you're good to go. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. So I think we can start. You can now get me? Yes, we can. Okay. And you can also see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Maybe. Thank you very much and sorry about that. Uh, as it was said, we're going to start with a presentation on amendment of, uh, on amending legislation. Then we would briefly uh, go to penalty provisions and then we'd finally do something on time in legislation. And because of time, uh, which has passed, I would request that you allow me to uh, straight away uh, go to the topic. And uh, I would first indicate that in issues of amending legislation, we only have one provision where the term amend is uh, defined. And this is in Cap 2, Interpretation and General Provisions Act, Chapter 2, Laws of Kenya. And uh, the... Uh, Interpretation of General Provisions Act, Chapter 2, Laws of Kenya, which says that amends include to repeal, revoke, rescind, or yeah, but amend includes uh, repeal, revoke, rescind, cancel, replace, add to, or vary, and the doing of any two or more of these things simultaneously or in the same uh, written law or instrument. So that's the only place where we have the term amend uh, properly defined in law. But my, inter my definition of amendment is to alter the text of an existing legislation to suit a circumstances that has changed. For instance, we may have political circumstances changing, calling for amendment of the constitution. We may have economic circumstances changing, calling for amendment of certain uh, legislation, or even social circumstances, which may also call for amendment of the legislation. I'm saying that amend, in my definition, is to alter the text of an existing legislation to suit the circumstances that has changed. The reason I'm emphasizing that is that to amend, therefore, is not to correct. It does not mean the law that you seek to amend is in itself uh, having a uh, mistake. For us to understand the issues of amending legislation, we need to appreciate the jurisdictional nomenclature in amendments. For instance, in Kenya, our jurisdictional nomenclature is such that previously we could talk about sections of the constitution. Right now we talk about articles of the constitution. In other jurisdictions, they also say sections. So how we call our, uh, we refer to our various provisions matter in, in circumstances of amendment. We can also amend uh, acts of parliament and we can also amend a bill. We can amend rules or we can amend regulations. Now, when we are amending the constitution, the terminology used is we amend an article of a constitution. I know as lawyers, we may be aware of this, but this may not be taken for granted for purposes of amendment because we have an article that is the main provision. Then we have a clause, article one of the constitution, clause two of article one of the constitution, paragraph A of clause four of article one of the constitution, and then some paragraph um, three of paragraph A of clause four of article two of the constitution. So article has the figure one, two, three. Clause has the figure one, two, three, but in bracket. Paragraph has a lowercase letter in bracket, and subparagraph has a Roman, um, Roman letters, I mean, Roman numbers numerals in bracket. So that's important. Now, for Acts of Parliament, we talk about sections, subsection, paragraph, and then subparagraph, where section is section two, as it is, subsection is subsection two in bracket, paragraph is the lowercase paragraph D, and subparagraph is in Roman. 
amendment of a bill, we talk about a clause, not a section now. A clause, then a subclause, then a paragraph, then subparagraph. We also have amendments of statutory instrument, for instance, regulations, rules, orders, guidelines. So here, if you talk about regulations, we say regulation one, sub-regulation uh, two, paragraph B, and sub-paragraph three. So again, it follows. And then when you talk about rules, like the civil procedure rules, we talk about rule two of the civil procedure rules, sub-rule three of rule two of the civil procedure rules, paragraph B of sub-rule two, of rule two of the civil procedure rules and then subparagraph accordingly and the same applies to regulation the reason i'm emphasizing this uh, we are going to note it in our subsequent slides because you had situations and i repeat i mentioned even to the class in the morning where lawyers even senior lawyers are finding themselves in court referring to sub article three of the constitution in the constitution for purposes of amendment we do not have sub articles those are in international instruments like um like um, you know uh, uh, the Rome statute or any other international convention those ones we talk about sub articles and articles in our amendment the jurisdictional nomenclature is very important if you appreciate this then we'll find it applying in the next uh, couple of slides now when we're amending the constitution there's no other way of amending the constitution other than by a constitutional amendment bill. So to amend the constitution, we must generate a bill. There's no other way. To amend an existing act of parliament, we must also uh, generate a bill. So amending the constitution or amending an act of parliament can only be done by what you call an amendment bill. But we have other minor amendments which can be done in, a, in, a, in an omnibus way. We always have, for instance, where we have several minor amendments in related statutes or not even related statutes, then we generate a statute law miscellaneous amendment bill. Uh, sometimes we can also do this in an omnibus bill like the finance bill, or we can also amend several related laws like the land laws. We can look at all the land statutes where we need to amend, then we call them the land laws amendment bill. So it will only amend related laws. You remember sometime in 2015, we have the Securities Amendment, uh, Securities Laws Amendment Act. So it sought to amend several laws that were touching on matter security. So a bill can also be amended. You see, we're talking about amending the Constitution or amending Acts of Parliament. But again, a bill itself at the stage after it has been published either in the Senate or the National Assembly or a county assembly, that a bill can also be amended. That bill can also be amended. And the amendment of a bill is done generally at committee stage. We are aware that every bill undergoes three readings. The first reading where they read the long title, the second reading, and then the third reading. After the second reading, it's committed to uh, co the committee. So committee generates amendments, of course, after public participation. That is called uh, committee stage amendment. That is done only to bills. But again, we can also amend structural instrument. Like I said, regulations, rules, orders, we can also amend them. So how do we go about it? In drafting uh, amendments, the language of amendment is very important. For instance, when we're talking about an article in a constitution, in the constitution, like Article 2 or Article 3, when we want to do away with it, we repeal it. So Article 1 of the Constitution of Kenya, uh, sorry, we can say at the Constitution of Kenya is amended by repealing Article 2. That's we have done away with it. Or we say, the Constitution of Kenya is amended by repealing Article 2 and replacing by the following new article. Then you bring in the article that you want to uh, put in. So the language matters for articles in the Constitution or clause in the Constitution, we use the word repeal or we use the word repeal and replace. Now for sections of a statute, section in an Act of Parliament, again, if you're doing away with the whole of it, then we say you repeal. If you're bringing a new whole section, then you are replacing. So we say repeal and replacement, or just repeal, based on what your intention is. For clauses in a bill, we also repeal in a bill. Like we said, a bill can also be amended. When you're doing away with the whole provision, the whole clause, then we repeal, or we can bring in a new one. That means we shall repeal and replace. So we'll say, for instance, clause uh, four of the land amendment mm. bill is repealed is repealed and 
replaced with the following new clause. So you repeal and replace the language of amendment. Now for subsections, because we say that an act has a section, it has subsection, it has paragraphs, it has subparagraphs. For a subsection, we delete. We now do not repeal. We delete. If we want to bring in a new one, then we delete and insert a new one. For paragraphs, we also delete and insert. For subparagraphs, we delete. If we want to do away with it, insert or we substitute therefore. And the word substituting therefore, you notice from our slide, the therefore has no E. We say this because it's only in a many legislative drafting we try to discourage a lawyerism or legalese. We do not want you to use several terms that lawyers use. You can use that in uh, demand notes or other legal documents, but in legislative drafting we use simple language. It's only words like therefore which cannot be substituted otherwise that we retain. So for subparagraphs we delete. When you want to do away with it we in, and insert a new one, or we substitute, therefore, a new subparagraph. For words and expressions, there are words in a, in a legislative sentence. Again, we delete, insert, or substitute, therefore. We'll demonstrate this. The use of language is very important based on uh, the provision of the law that you want to amend. The example I'm giving here, uh, we gave the same example so in the morning. It's a relevant uh, example. Your instructions, perhaps you do in consultancy for a particular institution. You've been hired as a lawyer to draft amendments for, let me use the BBI, for instance, which is uh, really trending at the moment. Or you are doing something for, uh, I mean, for, you, for your own organization where you work. So your instruction as a private lawyer or as a lawyer employed by an institution, you are required to amend the constitution to provide for equal sharing of revenue raised nationally between the national and the county government. So that's what you've been asked to do. Your client has asked you to amend the constitution to provide for equal sharing of revenue raised nationally between the national and county government. It is imperative, very important, that you abrace yourself with the statute book. Every lawyer should know his statute book well and two, should appreciate the constitution that will help you identify very easily the area where you seek to amend to satisfy the instructions and the requirements of your client in this circumstance where we require to amend the constitution to provide for equal sharing of revenue raised nationally between national and county government um, the relevant article of the constitution is article 202 clause 1 which provides that revenue raised nationally shall be shared equitably among the national and county governments. This is the law as it is. Article 202, clause 1 says, revenue raised nationally shall be shared equitably among the national and county governments. Remember, it is only revenue raised nationally. That means it's not revenue raised from counties. The only revenue which we need to share equitably and not equally, we need to share it equitably among the national county government is that that has been raised by the national government. Now, in any amendment, we have two uh, aspects of amendment. We have a non-textual amendment, then we have a textual amendment. In our jurisdiction, we do not uh, use non-textual amendments. It's used in other jurisdictions. In non-textual amendment, it's very simple because other jurisdictions do not have an official government printer somewhere. So once parliament... Uh, or whichever house that legislature, the, whichever legislature makes um, amendments and they adopt it, all they need to do, perhaps they don't even need to have a bill to be taken to be assented to like we do. So all they need to do, once the house passes, then they get a soft copy of the law or like constitution. They literally delete the word equitably and replace with the word equally in the official version of the publication and they circulate. And that does not become... Uh, part of the amending act. They do not need an extra bill or an extra amending act to amend their, con their, their, their constitution or their act. In our circumstance, we use the textual. And in our textual amendment, we draft a complete bill if we are to amend the constitution. I was saying in the morning to the morning class that if you want to amend one word in the constitution, you have to come up with a bill, unfortunately, because there's no other way of amending the constitution other than by way of bill. If you want to amend two words in an act of parliament, you have to come up with a bill. 
So unfortunately, in our situation, if you come up with a bill, it is a bill like any other, and it has to undergo the whole journey. For instance, you have to establish whether or not it's a money bill. You have to uh, demonstrate that it has undergone public participation in terms of Article 10 and Article uh, 118 of our Constitution. If you are amending the Constitution, whether you're changing a word or two or the whole article, you have to be sure whether or not it will require a referendum. So it is a bill like any other bill. Now, in our situation, therefore, the concern or the question or the issue that your client wants is that you amend the Constitution to provide for division of revenue that has been raised nationally, which should be shared equally, not equipped, equitably, among the national and county government. As I said, you have to come up with a complete bill. We have done the drafting of bills in our previous classes, and so we are aware that for you to come up with a bill, you have to have the title of the bill. In this situation, we have a Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2021. And remember, we can have several constitutional uh, amendment bills which are published. So the first one will not have, will just be Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill. If you publish a second one, it will be Constitution of Kenya Amendment Number two, we do put a bracket number two bill. If it is a third one, Constitution of Kenya Amendment number three bill, because it can be advanced by several members, different members of parliament or different government ministries or different interest groups. In this circumstance, a bill must have a title. Now, a bill must also have a long title, whether it's only amending one word. So in our circumstance, it will be a bill for an act of parliament to amend the constitution. So you see, we must have a complete bill. The title must be there. The long title must be there. Then we have the enactment clause. Let's say enacted by the Parliament of Kenya as follows. The enactment clause is a very important provision which must be in a bill, as we may have learned earlier. Now, the enactment clause, uh, like I said, uh, it gives uh, the bill its um, one is jurisdictional identity because that's why the only place we have a Parliament of Kenya and uh, also it gives it uh, constitutional authenticity. And uh, like I said some time back, um, where we have acts which don't have enactment clause in the USA, we have case law where cases have been thrown out because a bill which was passed just for missing the enactment clause. I'm saying that a bill which we are drafting here must have all the provisions of a bill just to amend the constitution. Now, we have the short title of this bill and it may read this act may be cited as the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Act. Uh, the 2018 there could be 2021. And sometimes we provide for a commence, uh, commencement clause and shall come into force on the first day of July, 2021. So it must have a short title. Now we come to the crux of it, the substantive issue that we are seeking to solve by drafting this amendment bill. Remember, we are told that Article 202 of the Constitution, that at clause one, says revenue shared uh, nationally, revenue raised nationally shall be shared equitably between the national and county government. Now we want to change it so that it reads that revenue raised nationally is now shared not equitably, but equally. And again, it's shared between the national and county uh, government. So to draft that, you can look at what I've provided for in Clause 2, which says Article 2 of 2 of the Constitution is amended by deleting the word equitably, appearing in Clause 1, substituting therefore the word equally. So what we've done, uh, the language of amendment, we had mentioned that if you are doing away with words, then you are deleting if it's words. If you're bringing a new word, then you're substituting therefore. And that's the language I've used in our um, in clause two of this bill by saying article 202 of the constitution is amended by deleting the word equitably, substituting therefore the word equally. And remember, I've still captured clause one. I didn't say article 2021. I said article 202 of the constitution is amended by deleting the word equitably appearing in clause one because we may have another word equitably appearing in another clause of that article. So it's good to be specific on the amendment which you're seeking to uh, do. So it's uh, the one appearing clause one, substituting therefore the word equally. Now, the second example is still on this particular article. Now, if you are now required to amend the constitution to provide that all the revenue raised in the country 
be shared equally between the national and county government. Uh, if you allow, uh, very fast, in our first uh, instruction, we were required to amend the constitution to provide for equal sharing of revenue, which is raised nationally, not the one raised from the county government. The second example is different because it calls for, uh, it's asking you that the revenue shared, uh, to be shared, should be one raised both from governments and from the national government. We are saying that revenue raised from the national government, from whichever source, taxes and everything, revenue raised from the Turkana oil, revenue raised from Lake Victoria fish, revenue raised from coffee um, and tea, uh, maybe in different parts of the country. So all that revenue is put into one consolidated fund, one basket, and then they are shared not equitably, but equally. So this is the second instruction. In which case, if you sought to do that amendment, then we now look for revenue raised nationally shall be shared equitably among the national and county government. That is what the article provides as it is. So if we were to amend this, it would be slightly different from our earlier amendment, which only deleted the word equitably and substituted therefore the word equally. Here we'll do a little more. Let's see. We draft a bill. Presuming this bill, like the other one, had its long title, it also had an enactment clause, it had a short title, so we go to the provisions. Now, in this one, our short title will start, this act may be cited as the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Act 2021, and shall come into force on the first day of July 2021. Now, here, we start with Article 202 of the Constitution, is amended in Clause 1. See, I've now changed the language. In clause one, by the first amendment A, inserting the word and from counties immediately after the word nationally. Then we go to the second amendment B, deleting the word equitably, appearing immediately after the word shared, and substituting therefore the word equally. We've now done two amendments. One, we've inserted the word and from counties. We've also inserted the word equally by deleting equitably. Remember, the first amendment, we've not deleted anything, we've only inserted and from counties to take care of the instruction from our client that is not only revenue raised nationally but revenue raised nationally and from the counties and now we we also want that after that revenue is raised is not shared equitably but it's shared equally currently we have 15 percent going to counties 85 percent uh, remaining in the national government of course for cdf and others but now we are being told it should not be 50 85 and 15 uh, we are aware that the BBI wants to take it to 35 or something like that. We are being told make it 50-50, but not just raise nationally, but let all the monies come from all the counties, put them together, share them equally between counties and national government. That will be the implication of that amendment. In our circumstance, we are interested with the language of the amendment and if they fall in place. So you've noticed that this particular amendment has two provisions, A and B. The reason why we put A and B is that in any house, in, if it's in parliament, they may carry the first amendment A. Revenue, that revenue rest, revenue to be shared equitably is also not only from the national government, but from counties. So they'll carry the first one. They may decline to carry the second one. If they carry, decline to carry the second one, then we are saying that revenue will be raised from national government and from counties, but it will be shared equitably, not equally. If they carry both, then revenue will be raised from both county and national government and it will be shared again equitably the way it's shared currently. So what is important is if we appreciate the language of amendment and we need to know that in amending the constitution or any act of parliament, it must come by way of an amendment bill. Which bill must have all the relevant and necessary provisions of a bill? Like I said, it must undergo public participation. It must be determined whether or not it's a money bill because money bills only can money bill can only originate from the National Assembly, according to Article 114 of the Constitution. They cannot originate from the Senate. Well, they will go to the Senate, but can only originate from the National Assembly. So, when you do a bill, you have to establish uh, all that. Now, the second example in amendment that we seek to give, rather the third example, is now not from the Constitution, but from an Act of Parliament. Uh, recently, we had um, the Marriage Act of 2014. It came to into force, I think, in 2015. And in the Marriage Act, if you look at Section 76 of that particular act, 
the marginal title is um, effect of a promise to marry. So section 76 of the Marriage Act as it is provides that except as provided in this section, a promise by a person to marry another person is not binding. I've bolded that. If you look at that act, that's what section 76 provides. It has nothing else. Now, some at common law or in other equitable uh, decisions, it has been decided that if you promise to marry someone, there was an offense, I think, sometimes in the penal code where promise to marry was an offense. We need to check it up. So if promise to marry is an effect, how then can it not be binding? I'm not changing the law, but I'm giving this an example of an amendment. Suppose you want to alter this circumstance and make it binding, because now the law says it's not binding if you promise to marry someone. You've been asked to prepare this amendment to section 76. Again, you have to provide for a title, the Marriage Amendment Act of 2021. You have to provide for the long title, a bill for an act of parliament to amend the Marriage Act, you have to provide for enactment clause enacted by Parliament of Kenya as follows. You need to go to your short title, which will read, this act may be cited as the Marriage Amendment Act 2021. Then you go to your, your uh, clause 2, where you say section 76 of the Marriage Act, we bracket in this act referred to as the principal act, is amended by deleting the words is not and substituting therefore the words shall be. You know, the only words we've deleted there are two words, is, not. We have substituted the word shall be. I indicated that when you're dealing with words, you delete and substitute therefore. And like when you're dealing, when you want to deal with, do away with all of this section 76, you would have said that the marriage act is amended by repealing section 76. There we would use the word repeal because we are dealing, doing away with the whole section. But here, since we're only dealing with words and we want to do away with those words and start bringing in new words, we say the, uh, we start with the word section 76. Remember, if I was to repeal the whole act, then I would start with the word the marriage act. I would not start with section 76. I would say the marriage act is amended by repealing section 76. But since I want to do something within that particular section, I start with the word section 76 of the Marriage Act. And we always say in this act refer to as a principal act so that if you have to amend other provisions in the Marriage Act, then you just say if you're amending section 78, then you now say um, section 78 of the principal act. You don't need to say again the Marriage Act. If you're amending section 90, you say section 90 of the principal act. So that's why in our first um, provision, Clause two, we say in this article, sorry, in this act, refer to us the principal act to give you rooms to keep on amending without necessarily now referring to the marriage act, the marriage act. So uh, what's important here is the language we use based on what we want to do. If you want to delete a whole section, if you want to delete a paragraph, if you want to delete words, or if you want to amend uh, provision of a constitution, the whole of it. Now, be that as it may, we have other considerations that come into place or into play when we are doing an amendment. We need to consider, is it a substantive or a miscellaneous amendment? Substantive amendments are in two ways. One, if we have several provisions of a particular act which you want to amend, then we'd say that's substantive. In terms of quantity, there are so many amendments, in which case you ask yourself, why do we need to make all these amendments? You make the statute uh, a bit you know, untidy. So why don't I just do away with the whole bill, the whole act, bring a new act, in which case you are repealing. Remember our first definition of amendment in section two of cap two was that amendment includes repeal, you know, revoke, rescind. So if it's substantive, then we repeal the whole act. You don't need to make so many amendments. Bring in a new bill to repeal the, the other, uh, the existing act. Now, if it's miscellaneous, I've said we can also have statute law miscellaneous. If you have several amendments that you want to make in several laws, then you can have statute law miscellaneous. But if the amendment you want to make is, is very minor in your view, then you can incorporate it in that year's finance bill based on the nature of the law or that year's statute law miscellaneous amendment because we have about two. In Kenya, we always have about two every year, the first one and the second one. We used to have only one. But nowadays, because of the demand from several ministries and quarters, we have several. So 
Is the amendment substantive? It is substantive, then proceed to prepare an amendment bill. If it is miscellaneous, then you can draft an amendment uh, bill with only one provision, or you can choose to have it be incorporated in the statute law miscellaneous amendment for that particular year. Again, is it a consequential amendment? Does it affect other laws? Ordinarily, if you want to amend, for instance, the Kenya School of Law Act, you may realize that it may call your amendment may call for amendment of the Advocates Act, the Law Society of Kenya Act, the Council of Legal Education Act. So your amendment may affect other laws. So you need to check. That's why I say it as a, uh, as a, as a lawyer, you need to be abreast with the statute book. So you know several laws and how they affect each other. Because you can make one amendment and it has a consequential effect on another act. So you check that before. Is it a consequential amendment that you're making? Or will it have, or will your amendment have a consequential effect? Again, the drafting of marginal or head notes in an amendment, if you're drafting an amendment, if, for instance, you want to uh, do away with Article 3 of the Constitution, you you marginal notes. Our Constitution use head notes, uh, but our other laws use marginal notes. We have, we have Kenya law printing them, I mean publishing them with head notes, but uh, the ones which are passed and are sent to are in all in marginal notes. So our marginal notes uh, should read, for instance, Article 3 of the Constitution. If you want to do away with it, you say repeal of Article 3 of the Constitution. If you are doing away with it, bring in a new one, you say repeal and replacement of Article 3 of the Constitution in Kenya. Now, if it's an act of parliament, call it land law, for instance, uh, or land registration act, you will say um, repeal and replacement of Section 3 of the Land Act. Or you can say, if you're only amending provisions in that particular section, then you can say, um, you, you will write in your marginal note, amendment of section 3 of number 3 of 2012. Here you don't mention the, the whole act. You just mention the citation. For instance, we have CAP 300, we have number 2 of 2012, we have you know, number 23 of 2013. So in the drafting of amendments, your marginal notes must also provide clearly for what you seek to amend. And I'm saying, if you're amending, for instance, Statute of Arrangement Act, say amendment of section four of number 23 of 2013. That is what should be in your marginal note. Which other consideration are the effects of amendment? Um, now, if you do away with uh, a, particular act, uh, a particular act, the whole of it, we say you have repealed it. That's an effect of amendment. The law is repealed. If you're doing away with a particular provision, then uh, you're still repealing those provisions. Now, another effect is rectification. Ordinarily, rectification is used where we have an act of parliament passing. If it passes, then um, it may have an error. For instance, parliament debated in the order paper, in the Hansard, a provision was discussed, debated, and approved. But at the point of going to publish and assenting by the president, something is omitted. I'll give it best example is the Land Act, where we sought to repeal so many other acts, but they forgot to repeal. Uh, at, at the point of publishing, they forgot to repeal something in the schedule. So the attorney general, or in the case of counties, the county attorney has the powers under Revision of Laws Act, Chapter 1, Laws of Kenya, to prepare what we call a rectification order. A repetition order seeks to correct or amend a provision in an act which rectifies. It just rectifies an error without necessarily taking it back to parliament. Remember, the president has assented to it. It's already law. So by way of a rectification order, the, uh, we prepare a rectification order and you correct that mistake. Remember, it's still an amendment. So it has an effect of an amendment, but it does not necessarily go back to parliament. That is published by the government printer and it becomes law as it is. Revocation is another effect of amendment, but revocation is to subsidiary legislation. The way we say an uh, act of parliament has been repealed. Uh, in subsidiary legislation, we don't say repeal, but we say re re regulations have been revoked. Rules have been revoked, not repealed. So it's just a terminology used for statutory instrument. Then we have annulment. It's an effect of amendment. Generally, annulment uh, for acts of parliament is done by courts. Uh, courts of competent jurisdiction. So the court may annul a provision. This has happened several times. We have several decisions 
The other day we had um, several, about 23 set of statutes, uh, which have been annulled. They've been given one year because it is said uh, that they did not conform to uh, constitution. And so the courts have an, uh, proposed annulment for 23 statutes. So when the courts propose annulment, that's a whole statute. The courts can also annul just a provision of a statute, declare a particular provision unconstitutional. That again will be an annulment. Remember, we may not necessarily take uh, uh, amend that thing again in parliament because the court, by way of operation of the decision of a court, that provision is no longer operational. It is void to the extent of the decision of the court. So that is another effect of annulment. Ordinarily, what happens is that uh, in Kenya, we have the Kenya Law Reform Commission, which deals with revision of laws, law reform. And so after 10 years, they're supposed to take all the laws which were amended, which were annulled, and clean or just sanitize the, the statute book so that of everything which was amended after a couple of years, and I think now they do it sooner. They, they now they do it faster than 10 years. If the court declared something unconstitutional, then they would remove it. The last is the corrigenda or corrigenda. Now, corrigenda has the same effect as a rectification. We are saying that the AG can prepare rectification order under revision of laws act to correct an error in an act of parliament without necessarily taking it back to parliament. And if it is a light error, if it's not a very um, subtractive error, now, a corrigenda is where we do the same, but this is now for a statutory instrument. We can prepare a corrigenda for a regulation. We can prepare a corrigenda for a rule, like the civil procedure rules. If there was an error by the maker, if the CJA or the rules committee in making the rules made an error, they want to correct it, they prepare a corrigenda. If the cabinet secretary, in preparing certain regulations, had an error, then they can correct that minor error by way of a corrigenda, not an amendment. Remember, if it is a major change that they seek to do, then they'll amend regulation, they prepare amendment regulation. If it is a minor error, then they can prepare a corrigendum. Uh, it's important to note that unlike amendments, uh, unlike other forms of amendments, like repealing, revocation, rectification for an act and corrigendum for a regulation are errors, they are mistakes which are being corrected. But um, the general amendments are not mistakes, they are altering the substance and the text of the law to meet the circumstance which is required at the time. And uh, I think uh, I'll leave that there unless there are other questions on amendment. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I should not have, I should not have thank stopped. you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dima. I think we can allow you to sip some water, perhaps sanitize before we have you do your second part of the presentation. Now, at this particular point, I invite questions from class, maybe for the next five minutes or so. If you're ready to ask a question, just put your hand up before we go to the next presentation. So if you're ready to ask a question, just put your hand up. We'll have a session for the students who are unable to join us. Maybe you can also just Put it on the chat if you have any question. Post it in the chat. For now, do you have any question? Okay, um, Mr. Dima, allow me to read one from the chat. Seeing that we have none from. Um, so the question is okay, from um, Mr. Mr. Paul Dima, allow me to read one from the chat. What is your view on the use of an omnibus statute to amend substantive issues? I think so far that is the only question. Let me just see. I think that is the only question so far. Mr. Dima, maybe you can respond to that before you start your second session. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Kongo. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it's a very important question. Um, yeah, I can see the other one is statutory instrument limited to subsidiary legislation. I've also seen yes. another question. Yeah. Okay. Is, uh, let, me, let me see. Um, so, uh, is the term statutory instrument limited to subsidiary legislation? I think that's the second question. Okay. Is the term limited to subleg? Yeah. Okay. I think so far you can you can respond to those as we wait for others. 
Okay. Yeah, can I go on? Yes, please go on. Okay. Now, um, uh, the question from Paul uh, is so very important. Whether, in our view, um, the use of omnibus statutes to amend uh, laws uh, is a, a good thing, I do not think it's a, a, a good thing. Actually, it is a shortcut. And it's a shortcut that in, in Kenya has not been used for a very long time, actually. I think, um, I, I really cannot trace exactly when we first started using that. But after the new constitution, I think the first omnibus um, statute that we had was the Security Laws Amendment of 2015. And you see, it brought a lot of problem, the OIM chaos in parliament, because the media, for instance, perhaps did not want certain amendments. They thought it would gag the media. Uh, other aspects of security laws were also um, uh, affected. And so if you go with an omnibus amendment statute, they remember it comes in one bill where other people do not agree with certain parts, other people agree with certain parts, and it brings uh, chaos. Unlike where we have specific bills for amending different provisions, where if it dies, then it does not necessarily kill the other aspects of amendment. So in my view, it is not the best, but it's one of the avenues that we use. It is best used in the finance matters. For instance, a finance act of a particular year, remember we'll touch on several finance legislation while, um, uh, so that's necessary. But I, in my view, it's not the best to use um, an omnibus statute to amend, uh, amend laws. The, the second one, I would say, is um, uh, whether the term statutory instrument is limited to subsidiary legislation. Now, in Kenya, that is the situation. The word of the term statutory instrument has been used in other jurisdictions, sometimes to ad, uh, apply even to ministerial proclamations or um, certain memos which the minister could use at certain times, and uh, or even the president. Once they reduce into writing, they used to call them statutory instrument. Now, in Kenya, from 2013, we enacted the Statutory Instrument Act, number 23 of 2013. It defines statutory instrument specifically to include uh, regulations. It includes rules. It also includes guidelines. It includes orders, like presidential orders, and letters patent. So it has specified statutory instrument to refer purely to subsidiary legislation, most of which have give obligations and most of which have are, are enforceable as law. And so it's not just a communication from a government uh, body that seeks to communicate. So it's subsidiary legislation, which is defined again in CAP 2, is the same thing as statutory instrument. Although CAP 2 only touches on two, rules and regulation, the Statutory Instrument Act expands it to include four or five other uh, nature of instruments. I can see again another question from Mr. Alex Matu, say that how does the drafter establish commencement date given the challenges it might face before it is passed? That's a good question. Um, if you look at Article 116, Clause 2 of the Constitution, it provides for how laws come into force. We used to, we used to draft the commencement clauses before the new Constitution. And how did it go? It, go, it went like... Um, uh, this act may be uh, cited as the Land Act. Then you say commencement and shall come into force on such date as a minister shall, by notice in the Gazette, appoint. That means a law could be passed by the president, but it needed an appointment date by the minister. So the minister could gazette that date before the act comes into force. A quick example is the Biosafety Act of 2009. It was passed, enacted in 2009 and assented to, but it could not come into force because the minister had not made a commencement. So it had to wait for two years up to 2011 for it to come into force. These powers that were arbitrarily used by the ministers is what Article 116, Clause 2, sought to cure, so that it reads that an act of parliament comes into force on the 14th day after its publication in the Gazette, unless the act stipulates a different date on or time at which it will come into force. So uh, the drafter cannot establish the commencement date. Remember, you are drafting for your client. So if it is the Ministry of Lands and you are amending the Act, then you can ask them when do they want it to come into force. I could give you a quick example of the CDF Act of 2015. 
the National Government CDF Act. It was repealing the former CDF Act, which was declared unconstitutional. In this act, they had been given 12 months to review. So in these 12 months, therefore, the act had to come into force on a particular date. So we put the commencement date of the National Government CDF Act to be on the 19th of February, 2015, because the other one had been declared unconstitutional on the 19th of February, on, on the 20th of February, 2014. 12 months, therefore, we had to give it according to what the court said. So it's not for the drafter, but you can guide as a drafter or as a lawyer, you can guide your client when you think it will it come into force. Otherwise, even if you don't provide for a commencement date, then Article 116, Clause 2 comes into play because it already tells us that once an act is published in the Gazette, then 14 days it comes into force. This also applies to the president. If the president does not assent to an act within 14 days, then again, it automatically becomes law. So it should not be so much an issue for the draft unless you want to guide uh, your, your, your client for that the drafter can decide to place a date. But don't say by notice in the Gazette. Provide for a date oh. and or time. You can even say midnight. Uh, uh, Mr. Dima, Dima, yes. I think, I think, uh, I think uh, you can answer one more question. One more question. Then yes. we allow you to then go then to question two so yeah. that we don't get caught up with time. Maybe okay. the question I can quickly pick. Yeah. It's from uh, Timothy. On what basis is the jurisdictional nomenclature selected? Why, yes. for example, do we elect to change from sections of the Constitution to articles? I think that is quite relevant. So okay. you can respond to that, then we allow you to go to part two of your presentation. Okay. Then we'll come back to the questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the, the decision as to whether to Christian a provision, an article, or um, a section, we really don't have a basis. It is just the interest uh, of the country. But remember again, that we operate within um, uh, uh, we, a jurisdiction. For instance, our drafting style has to go with what goes on in the general uh, Commonwealth drafting style. It started in the UK uh, in 1789, with, no, 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 in, in 1896 with the Lord Thring, and it continued in India. And after the colonization, we adopted one common drafting style. Remember? When the counties came up, they adopted our drafting style. Nairobi County cannot come up with its own drafting style. So generally, what informs that is just the history, but uh, not, not a decision. So perhaps we felt other, all other countries talk about articles, and in Kenya we're talking about section, and that's why we changed it as such. Thank you. Okay, to the other one. Um, Mr. Dima, I think we can't hear you. Are you still with us? Mr. Dima, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm just getting the slide back. Oh, I'm okay. Just All right. Slide back. Just changing the slide one minute and get back to you. Okay.
Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. You can hear me. Y yes, we can hear you, but we are not able to see the slides. Oh yeah, uh, we're just getting the slides. So okay. I just wanted to start. Um, okay. Yeah, are you seeing the slides? Yes, but uh, we are now seeing. Yes, now we can see the panel provisions now. Oh, wait, wait. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. It's just uh, this technology thing. No problem. I think I think the students have noticed the <laughs> yeah. same, and uh, they are quite forgiving. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah. Um, we the second one is penal provisions, which will be very fast. Um, this is dealing with the uh, matters of penalty in terms of drafting. What happens is that a law is only as good as it's enforceable. So if we draft a legislation and you don't provide for penalty provisions and properly so, then it may not be enforceable. It may be implementable in certain aspects, but that law will not be enforceable. So that penalty provisions are the means by which a provision of an act is enforced. I've just given an example there, that a person who contravenes any provision of this act for which no penalty is provided commits an offense and shall be liable upon conviction to a fine not exceeding 50,000 shillings or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding three months or both. We are saying this is a general penalty, but we can have situations where we have each provision which requires to be enforced, perhaps having a penalty uh, provision or penalty clause. And that depends on, uh, uh, on a number of things. We need principles that guide us in drafting penal provisions. So to draft penal provisions, we must uh, introduce the offense by describing the conduct and a prohibition, uh, under prohibition, and the declaration of this conduct as an offense. We are saying, therefore, that without express declaration of a conduct as an offense, there is no offense. So there must be an offense. You must create an offense expressly for it to form an offense in that particular legislation. There can be no implied criminalization. We are saying again that an offense, if you have to draft a penal provision, it has its objective elements. That's the doing part of it, of the conduct. That is the action, the omission, or specific factual elements that must take place for the conduct to lead to be to the offense. Then the subjective element, which you've studied in our criminal law and criminal procedure classes, the thinking part of it, the mens rea. What level of intent is required or how is fault established? So an offense must have those two uh, fundamental principles for it to qualify. So in drafting an, a provision, ensure you use terms, for instance, in these classes of offense, where a mental element is required. We have offenses where require mental element and uh, for a prerequisite for prosecution. So you have to use the term knowingly. A person shall not knowingly do this. A person shall not intentionally, or a person uh, shall not drive recklessly. You can drive, create an offense, but bring in the mens rea element by bringing in knowingly, intentionally, recklessly. We also have classes where mens rea must be proved for it to um, form an offense uh, worth prosecuting. And then we have offenses which are of strict liability, where total absence of fault is not a defense. So these classes of offense will guide the person, the drafter, in formulating the penal provisions. Again, very quickly, other considerations in drafting um, penalty provisions, where we're drafting a penalty provision to a body corporate, um, uh, could be a board or a, an institution, then it's imperative that we only include fines, or we provide for provisions which deny them a license, or we can refuse to renew their uh, licenses, or we can provide, for instance, in MCA Environmental Management and Coordination Act, we find situations where if, for instance, an institution polluted the environment, then other than the fines which may be imposed on them, they're required to restore that environment its original, uh, original situation. So restoration, renewal of, of um, denial, renewal of licenses, or issuing fines. Although I'm saying that recently, under POCAMLA, Process of Crimes and Money Laundering Act, we have institutions where if, for instance, members of a board or commissioners uh, committed an offense as a corporate, then they, I don't want to call it lifting the veil in these circumstances in order to bring company law, but they go for 
the members of the board, the chairperson, the CEO, that has happened recently, but it's a recent, um, you know, the recent thing. Uh, otherwise, it's the institution that is always made to, to be responsible and liable. In drafting other circumstances, for instance, the Sexual Offenses Act, it's important that we include defenses. And I'll uh, give an example just down there. In Sexual Offenses Act, if you're dra drafting uh, the penal provisions and you might want to put in a defense as a provision, you'll say, for instance, where a person an accused is charged with uh, defilement, then you will say that it shall be a defense if the accused had reason to believe that the complainant was above the age of 18, because that's important. And we have several defenses. It, it, it will be informed by the nature of the law you're drafting, because you don't want just to condemn people by, by law and close it. So you save the court and you save the defense lawyer by indicating the defense. So when you're drafting a penalty provision, you may be called upon to drive. It may be imperative that you provide for that particular uh, defense. Now, again, other requirements, for instance, consent of the director of public prosecution before you prosecute, uh, before you conduct prosecution. There are certain nature of offenses where you provide that no prosecution shall be commenced under this act or maybe under this section without uh, express written consent of the director of public prosecution. Formerly, it used to be the attorney general who was then the public prosecutor. So we can also provide for that requirement in drafting an, uh, 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 I mean, a penalty provision. You may want to provide for a defense based on the nature. You may want to seek the consent of the DPP because there are certain offenses where without the DPP, I mean, having the police having done their uh, investigations, reporting file to the DPP, then the DPP has to decide whether or not prosecution should commence. Otherwise, uh, such provision may be abused if you don't uh, put that shield. Now, in deciding uh, to include the level of jurisdiction of criminal court in a statute is also important because of the nature of offenses. We may have, for instance, you are drafting your bill. So in that act, you'll say court means high court or court means uh, chief magistrate court because we know certain offenses can only be tried in certain courts. Uh, capital offenses, for instance, cannot be taken into um, into you know resident magistrate's court in certain circumstances. So it may be important because based on the nature of the uh, uh, offense penalty offenses uh, penal provision that you're creating, you may decide to provide for the jurisdiction of the criminal court. We also have issues of minimum and maximum sentences. I was saying that in Kenya we really have a minimum sentence, but current drafting introduces it. We have provisions in the Cap 4.3 Traffic Act, which provides for a minimum sentence that a person uh, convicted of an offense uh, shall be sentenced to a uh, fine not lesser. Now, we do not really say not lesser, but generally we say not exceeding. And actually, that's a requirement of Cap 2. Uh, Cap 2 requires that we only provide for maximum sentence. Remember, Cap 2 is the main guiding uh, law in terms of um, in terms of uh, our drafting. So Cap 2 says do not provide for minimum sentences, but we've seen minimum sentences being provided, being given even in Pokamla, the Procedure of Crime and Money Laundering Act, the drafters and the members of parliament and the public think these offenses are too serious that we have to provide for minimum. Remember in law, if a law says that only provide for maximum, for you to change that, then go and amend that law. So providing for minimum sentences is not proper as uh, we stand now. So when you're drafting provisions, give maximum sentence, give maximum prison term, let the discretion of the court be left for others, whether the court wants to sentence them to one day or 10 days or three months, but provide for the maximum to guide the court. Again, uh, we may include administration penalties. For instance, based on the law you're dra drafting, it may not require for a punitive, a very punitive um, provision. You may want to say that you only want to give uh, somebody, you want to want to make somebody to step aside as investigations are going on, or better still, you may want to have suspension of a certain official officer as investigations are going on. May, not very punitive. Because at that time, um, maybe uh, you not read, reach the final decision. So in such a situation, it's imperative that we decide on what kind of uh, penalty you want to give. 
Then we have penalty for provision in subsidiary legislation. Now for subsidiary legislation, we are guided by both the Interpretation on General Provisions Act and also the Statutory Instrument Act. They say that subsidiary legislation can only attract a prison term of three months or 20,000 shillings maximum. That's according to CAP 2, Interpretation of General Provisions Act. The Statutory Instrument Act, which was which came into force in 2013, the alternative allows six months or uh, 20,000 shillings. Again, you cannot go beyond that. But ordinarily, where the Parent Act provides for a prison term, based on the offence that is sought to be created in subsidiary legislation, a rule or uh, general regulations, then sometimes it's allowed that um, you provide for a penalty, but not beyond what is stated in the um, Parent Act. Remember again, Section 13 of the Statutory Instrument Act allows where you, the Act seeks to provide for penalties, it can provide for that. So penalty in subsidiary legislation is guided by CAP 2 and also the Statutory Instrument Act, but again, also the Parent Act, where the Parent Act expressly provides that reg regulation shall be made for purposes of, uh, of fines and, and offences. Now again, there's a use of pictorial and symbols in penalties. We've seen situations where, I was looking up in the morning, where you have a cigarette, uh, picture of a cigarette, which is crossed. Now, that is not just a photo maybe in an establishment. You will note that if you go to the Tobacco Act or the Alcohol, Drinks and Control Act, we have so many pictorials. They say you shall provide for this in every establishment. You will indicate in a place which is very clear, a sign, a pictorial sign indicating no smoking. And sometimes you add the words uh, of fine of 50,000 or that uh, in Alcoholic Drinks Control Act, it says you must indicate that persons under 18 years are not allowed. And certain have pictorial and symbols. The Traffic Act has so many of them, no parking. All those things are found in the schedule to related to the offenses created under the Traffic Act and the traffic rules. They're not just pictures and photos made by uh, the, the road makers or, or establishment. So pictorials and symbols, as you draft your penal provisions, it may be necessary that you create pictorials and symbols. Remember again that we only ha we don't we have certain other uh, constituents in our uh, population, our jurisdiction. There are people who cannot read. Uh, Mr. Dima, we seem to have lost you again. Oh, you seem to have lost me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Maybe you, you can, Maybe go, you back can go back to the previous slide. The previous slide. Okay. The, that one? Yes. Yes. That one? The top? Yes. Yes. Okay. We are, we are here together now? Can I, I, I think go we're together. This? Okay. So I can go through this slide again. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. So I was indicating that other considerations that need to be taken care of in drafting penalty provisions are one, for instance, if you seek to draft offenses to uh, for bodies corporate in an act, a board, a commission, or any other body corporate that is stated in an act, then it may be imperative that we include fines. We include denial of licenses, renewals, we, we cannot renew your license, or we provide for requirements for restoration. I gave the example of EMCA, Environmental Management and Coordination, Coordination Act, which provides that even if an institution is fined for polluting in the environment, then they are required to restore it to the state in which it was before the pollution. So this can be incorporated in the penalty provisions. I was saying again, that in drafting penalty provision, based on the nature of the law that you're drafting, and I gave the example of the Sexual Offences Act, you can provide, after creating the offence and the sentence, you provide a defence. And we're saying the defence is here, for instance, that uh, an accused person, um, it shall be a defence. It said it shall be a defence 
if the accused person had reason to believe that the complainant or the victim was of uh, was above the age of 18 years so because defilement is for a person below 18 years so if that uh, the person had that reason to believe if it can that can be established in court of course we leave that for the courts uh, we have to provide for a defense so it's important to provide for defenses at certain times when you're drafting penalty provision again indicated that based on the nature of the law you're drafting and granted certain uh, offenses that you are creating it may require much more than just the police officer and the court so it may require that you seek the consent of the director of public prosecution and ordinarily we provide there we say that no uh, prosecution shall be commenced under this section unless with the written express uh, written consent of the deputy well, uh, sorry of the of the director of public prosecution so that is also a requirement if it is the if the nature of the offense that you have created calls for much more weight than require the dpp to give consent before prosecution commences i was indicating again that we need to decide to include the level of jurisdiction of the criminal court based on the offense you're creating in your penalty provision you may want to provide which court you think or which court it may be appropriate to try that particular offense and that's why we have for instance in um, capital sentences in capital offenses we have them tried only in certain courts high court you know or chief magistrate court and not in resident magistrate court so you do this by defining court after creating your offenses go back to the interpretation and say court means high court court means chief magistrate court i indicated again that we need to provide decide whether or not we provide minimum and maximum sentences and I said in other jurisdictions that is allowed in kenya we have seen it happen and i gave an example of traffic act cap 403 uh, also gave an example of pokamla process of crime and an anti money laundering act and a few other acts which provide for minimum sentences but ordinarily cap 2 which guides us in the drafting only allows that we should have maximum sentences and not minimum so we provide a uh, fine not exceeding 1 million a fine not exceeding 500000 a fine not exceeding 20000 but we do not provide for minimum although that has happened in certain circumstances because of the motive nature of the house which is passing it and the drafter perhaps in the nature of the offense again i said we can include administrative penalties for instance based on the nature of the offense we can only ask people to temporarily be out say of office stepping aside or we can provide for suspensions say when we still have investigations so it is a penalty but not very aggravated not very uh, serious like sentencing again i say that in penalty provisions in other subsidiary legislation we have guiding uh, we, are, we are guided by again interpretation and general provisions act and we are also guided by the statutory instrument act that is if we are to create penalty provisions in subsidiary legislation and i said that the interpretation general provisions act that cap two laws of kenya says that in a subsidiary legislation you can only put a penalty of three months or 20,000 shillings. Now, the recent statutory instrument act allows that if you create a subsidiary legislation, then you can include a penalty not exceeding uh, six months, but again, the amount is capped at 20,000 shillings. But we've seen situations where if the act, the parent act under which the subsidiary legislation is made, allows, expressly provides for creation of offenses under subsidiary legislation, then is always allowed to go beyond that, go above that, but only to the extent that it does not exceed the highest penalty given in the act. You cannot give uh, 10,000 shillings for a subsidiary legislation or a regulation where the act under which it is made has a maximum of 5,000 shillings. So that is important in providing your penalty provisions. Good to appreciate your static book. Again, I said you can use pictorials and symbols as giving example of certain prohibitions for instance in the tobacco act and the alcoholic drinks control act and other several other acts the traffic act and the traffic rules that attendant we use pictorials it's encouraged that as you draft the offenses you provide in the schedule that the persons going to apply them will also indicate 
in pictures, in pictorials, like having a cigarette in a circle and closing it, and also providing that a person, I mean, a smoking cigarette in this place shall attract um, a fine of 50,000. Well, we have the provision in the act, but it is imperative of the person implementing that to use the pictorial, which is always put in the schedule, to demonstrate that. And I was saying again, that there are certain uh, constituents of our jurisdiction who may not necessarily be able to read, but when they see a sign, they know what it is. Um, do not park here, you know, do not stop. So all that is found in the traffic rules. They're not just for the ministry. They're all guided by the drafter. The drafter in drafting the offenses, in creating certain prohibitions, also added pictorials and symbols. Madam Kumu, are you hearing me? Yes, loud and clear, uh, Mr. Loud Diba. Okay, so I can proceed? Uh, yes, yes, you can try and rush a bit. We don't have okay. so much time left. Okay, I think here we only have two or three more slides. And I was saying that in other issues on penal provisions, uh, we may have penalties drafted like in the penal code so that we had our, we have a penal statute carrying so many offenses that are related to several other statutes. And then the offense must be consistent with the constitution and the penal statute and related statutes. For instance, I was giving issues of abortion in the constitution. We have circumstances perhaps where it may be allowed. We cannot, in a law, seek to outlaw it completely, drafting an offense uh, prohibiting, say, abortion, bigamy, or something like that. Just an example. So it must be consistent with the constitution and the penal statute. Uh, it must not uh, conflict, for instance, with the penal code. Then it must clearly indicate the act or the omission which you intend to prohibit. That should be very clear. You should not leave it to chance. Then you clearly provide for the sanction. Do you want to discharge somebody? Is it a fine? Is it a community service? Is it a prison term? Uh, supplementary sanctions, for instance, if you, uh, and, and sanctions imposed under aggravated circumstances. A driver who repeatedly, a repeat offender, causes an accident, another accident, then if you cause an accident once, the and your sentence or fine, then the second accident, your driver's license may, may be, uh, uh, may be uh, impounded. So that is also uh, something you can provide in your offenses. A second offender, a repeat offender, uh, may be subjected to this and that penalty and provide the consequences of breach and then penalty for non-compliance, which should be contained in the sentencing policy. And remember I said we do not have a sentencing policy as a jurisdiction and that's why one drafter gives 100,000, another drafter gives 20,000 for the same offense in different statutes, but uh, that ought to be harmonized. Then being cognizant of territoriality in jurisdiction, I was giving an example of our own jurisdiction where we have different counties. One action or omission may be an offense in one county and not in another one. So it cannot be applied uniformly, even dressing based on religion, or certain other foods or something like that. So we need to be cognizant of territoriality in jurisdiction. And just to indicate the example which I gave, um, that should be a defense, where the accused person has reason to believe that the complainant say was 18. And again, in the Biosafety Act, we have no proceedings for an offense under this act shall be instituted with the prior written consent of the Attorney General, currently of the Deputy Public Prosecutor. And I think that's all for this particular uh, presentation. Maybe we can just get questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dima. Um, I'm going to pick a few questions because of lack of time. Uh, Mr. Dima, we, we are together? Yes. yes, we are together. All right. So I'll, I'll just pick a few because we can't have all of them. So yes. the first question I'll pick is from Alex. Before the new dispensation, by laws were delegated or subsidized legislation, what is the place of laws made by county assemblies in the hierarchy of Kenyan law. So basically, uh, right now that we don't have bylaws, what is the place of county laws? And then um, uh, Alex has asked two questions while skipping. Makora, Makora's question is, what is the difference between rules and regulations? And then lastly, I want to pick a question regarding BPI by Susan. Susan's question is, BPI is currently on the committee stage and public participation is ongoing. What purpose will this serve since the bill cannot be amended? So I think those three questions suffice for now. 
then we go to your very last part, which will take five minutes. Sadima, I hope we have not overwhelmed you with our questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll attend to questions, um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll request that we 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 lean much towards towards the drafting of it or okay. interpretation of the statute. <laughs> yeah, for okay. purposes of I had as uh, one participant mentioned exams and all. But okay. It's okay. Now, um, once said now that we do not have bylaws, what is the place of county laws, county legislation? These are very important questions. One, it's very important to indicate that we still have bylaws. Are, are we are we together? Yes, yes, know? we are. We are together. Okay, okay. I'm saying we still have bylaws. Let me take uh, the the person who raised that question back to uh, again section two of the statutory instrument act. I was just saying that statutory instrument means regulations, means rules, means bylaws, means orders means letters patent so bylaws are actually still existing save that uh in hierarchy in the hierarchy of our legislation of course we have the constitution then act of parliament then we have this subsidiary legislation which we will mention but when it comes to bylaws they come below the rules and regulations generally bylaws should be made by counties right now we have bylaws made by counties we still have bylaws made by several organizations we just have architects association they made their bylaws so bylaws are still used to date but they are the lowest in hierarchy in terms of legislation uh, based on the nature and purpose so if we want to tie that the place of county laws now county laws we should not uh, make that mistake county laws are actually at the same level with national legislation it's only that they serve different uh, provinces or different jurisdictions but County laws are exactly the same law. If a county makes a particular legislation, and if you contravene that particular a provision of that legislation, then the sentence will be as placed in that particular county law. So they are at the same level. And it's important that we understand that. The counties can also make their, through their laws, they can also make regulations and they can also make bylaws. So in hierarchy, national legislation and county legislation at the same level, if you go to Article 191 of the Constitution will tell you where each takes precedence. Certain times, county laws may take precedence in interpretation in court. At other times, national legislation may take precedence. The Constitution provides for where which take precedence, but they are at the same hierarchy. The second question, the difference between rules and regulation. Generally, the line is very thin, but where the statute requires you to make rules, then proceed to make rules. Why? Because rules are generally of a procedural nature, unlike regulations, which tends to impose obligations and duties on certain persons or certain institutions. So rules are procedural, the civil procedure rules. It tells us what to do when. But regulations are more uh, of, of, of create obligations. Both of them are however binding. On BPI, uh, that it's at committee stage and uh, and what, uh, uh, what then would be the purpose, if I got that right, uh, what happens is that once a bill, you see, what we have now is the referendum bill. So the referendum bill is what is um, being done now. Now, the committee stage of the BBI bill is just this procedural public participation of um, any other bill, where Article 10 and Article 118 requires that after the first reading, it's committed to a committee. Right now, the BBI is under the Committee on um, Justice and Legal Affairs. And that's why they've gone out to the people to get their views, to advise them on how to amend the BBI bill. So that bill will then come and it will be amended after the public participation. What, what the public have given will be amended. And that's why I was talking about in our slide on amendment, I was saying we can also amend a bill. So we'll amend the clauses based on what has come out from the public. So there's no conflict there. Uh, it's at committee stage. Once public participation ends, then we'll get what the public wanted and what they want changed in the provisions in that particular bill. And I think those were the only questions we had. Uh, thank you. We can go to the last one, which will take us about five minutes. 
Okay, um, please bear with us. We'll have 15 more minutes, then we wrap up the class. Okay. So bear with us. Class F, I know you have Mr. Munidia who's still here, who's given me permission to proceed. Class D, you remember we swapped classes by Domotieno, so this is still legislative drafting. So my only worry is E and G. So bear with us. Class reps who are here, if you have guests, uh, sorry, if you have lecturers waiting for the next class, just tell them to give us 10 minutes, we wrap up. This is a very important discussion. Mr. Dima is a very, very busy man. We are not, we are not going to be able to get him again. So please bear with us. So class reps, just chat to your lecturers and tell them to give us 10 minutes. Mr. Dima, when you're ready, proceed. Raymond, your hand has been up for quite some points. Maybe for quite some time, we can give you an opportunity. One minute to ask your question, Raymond. Your hand has been up for the longest. I think we've ignored you there a bit as Mr. Dima yeah, gets thank ready. You. Thank yes. you for the opportunity. Yeah, I wanted to ask what's the difference uh, in roles played by the draftsmen in the office of the Attorney General and those in the parliament. Okay. Oh, sorry, Raymond said the difference in in roles. Oh, exactly. Thank you very much. Now, what happened is that both the Attorney General and Parliament makes uh, do drafting, but the drafting in the Attorney General's chambers is largely for uh, subsidiary legislation, which are made from ministries and two from government bills. We have bills which emanate from the government ministries, but then the drafters in Parliament likely do the bills which are made from private members, although we also finalize because all legislation is finally done here, even if from the Attorney General, they still have to bring it to Parliament for polishing. So there is a lot of coordination between the two. So can I proceed? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Now the last uh, presentation, which is very short, is on time in legislation. Now, again, the reason why this is short is not that it's minor. Aspects of time in legislation is so wide that we cannot, we need like a whole day to discuss. And that's why I've quashed this into a very short uh, presentation. Is that in expressing time, we know this is in the Constitution and certain acts of Parliament, we may express a time uh, based on certain consequences to arise. Is it to arise at a particular point in time? What you're raising, give it the time within which you want it to happen. Or is it arising at a time, um, a period of time which is certain at each end? Or is it during a period of time, uh, the beginning of which or the end, but not both are certain? I'll give an example. Um, let's take us, ourselves back to uh, Section 3 of the Judicature Act, which was giving us, telling us which laws to rely on, actually which laws our courts were supposed to rely on apart from the constitution and other written laws, it was telling us that other than all those, we were relying uh, the Court of Appeal, the High Court, and uh, the Court of Appeal and subordinate courts were to rely on the status of the common law, the doctrines of equity, and the statutes of general application, which were enforced in England on the 12th of August, 1897. Well, of course, that's when it became uh, uh, protectorate. But that means laws which were enforced in England on the 13th or 14th of August do not apply to us. Only which were enforced as a 12th, 11th, going backwards. And that's why up to the time that we enacted our Marriage Act and Matrimonial Cause Act of 2015, we were relying on the 1882 Married Women Property Act of England up to recently because it was enforced in England as a 12th of August, 1897. That time was specific. Now, other times where a consequence is to arise during a period of time, certain at each end. For instance, we are talking about the president-elect being sworn in on the first Tuesday, whichever the date, but it's the first Tuesday. That first Tuesday shall follow the 14th day after the date of the declaration of the result of presidential election, or the seventh day, if there is a court case. So 
it is very specific. It talks about Tuesday. It does not talk about a number of days. So from that Tuesday, whatever date it will be, we count, we create time 14 days. We also create time seven days. As to how the time is computed, that is in Article 259 of the Constitution, which applies to all our statutes. For instance, if we don't six days, below six days, we don't count holidays and Sundays. After six days, we count all that. So that is important on how you craft uh, time. A uh, quick example again, where certain causes arise during a period of time of which the beginning or the end, but not both are certain. For instance, citizenship of Kenya. We say every person who having been born outside Kenya is on the 11th of December 1963, a citizen of the UK and colonies of British, uh, protected person. Then if your father or the mother would, even if they died, would or would but for his or her death have become a citizen of Kenya by virtue of sub subsection one, you are automatically a citizen of Kenya. So you see those dates are very specific if it was 11th of December. That is, if it was on 14th of December, your parents arrived in Kenya in between, then there's no way you become a citizen. The law has specified time. Uh, again, bills. We talked about Article 116, which provides for seven days. If we go to Section 11.1 uh, of the Statute Arrangement Act, it says you shall submit to Parliament after publication of any regulation within seven sitting days. The sitting was an, an amendment. Initially, it was seven days. So when you say seven days and say seven sitting days, they're different. So the drafter needs to know what your intention is. Seven sitting days is actually three weeks because the house sits for only three days every week. If we say seven days, then we count it literally in the calendar. So in providing for those provisions, it's important to indicate what exactly you want to provide for. And we have time on operation of laws, for instance, on commencement. We also uh, say, for instance, until after the first general election under the Constitution, the word cabinet secretary shall be constituted to mean minister. You can provide for that in an act. Remember, we may not have known where the general, when the general election would happen, when you're drafting a law before the election. But we are saying, some say, um, after the announcement of the presidential election. So you do not have the date, but you tie it to a condition which will happen on a particular time and date. So in drafting uh, expressions of time, it's important. We can say for appeal, for instance, appeal shall be within 14 days or shall be within 30 days. You have, you're providing for time in legislation. So in expressing time, we also use certain languages. It's important that you do not use at least, at least use not exceeding, because language is important in drafting. Again, uh, do not use before or say after or from so they exclude if you use that it excludes the day which is you seek to specify so use within see if you say within seven days then at least from you count it from the day and anything within those days so you don't use before or after and then avoid using terms like forthwith or as soon as possible we say without delay and then we can also say three clear days you see in the civil procedure act we talk about clear days uh, one would ask what are clear days. It may be acceptable if the word days is used elsewhere in the statute, then you talk three clear days. And this is a ground which the courts have used to throw out certain when someone's or not, for instance, served within the three clear days. So I said I was going to be very short here and uh, and uh, I would beg to uh, close it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thank you very much, Wilson. Made it quite short, but quite precise. Now, without wasting any more time, I wish to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Munyevia. Mr. Munyevia, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Great. Um, I, let me hand over to you for the rest of the five minutes we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dima. I always look forward to, to your lecture in term three or our course. And this you have done for the few years I've been here. But before I could say something, allow me to invite the president of the Kenya School of Law, uh, Baraza, I hope you are in, or you is not in the deputy to just speak on behalf of the students. I'm sure we have presidents of class. Yes. E, oh, good. I'm sure we have president of class E and others, but let's allow the president uh, to speak on your behalf, Mr. Baraza. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, first of all, is to thank 
you and Ms. Kumu and uh, our instructors in legal writing for making this happen, uh, for organizing this, even though it has been practiced, as you've mentioned, it still takes a lot of logistical uh, uh, planning for, for this to happen. So I'm very, very thankful. And on behalf of the council, I want to also express my thanks to the guest. Uh, that has been a very, very instructive lecture, I must say, uh, even with the technical challenges that we've had. Uh, that was very instructive. We've enjoyed, I have enjoyed, I've learned a thing or two uh, regarding the three uh, parts of the, of, of the presentation. And I'm glad that we did this today. And to my fellow students, I hope that as we, uh, you know, finalize this run, uh, this guest lectures uh, offering us the perspective we need uh, in preparation for the exam and even the life after uh, the, the exam. So thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. God bless you all. All right. Thank you very much, Baraza. And on behalf of the department, I want to thank the students for attentively following this. As I said from the beginning, term three is short, uh, exams are around the corner, and some of these materials you've been given are very critical in how you shall um, examine and how you shall approach the questions. And I like the questions that were put across. Uh, the ICT department, they did good job. They have been recording this, so you'll be able to uh, look at that. I'm sure some of you are wondering how do they become Dima Dima. Well, you have heard where you went, but here in the school, especially the CPD department, we normally offer a training course for five days on legislative drafting. After that, you become a certified drafter. You can be able to consult out there in the counties. And also, you may want at least to work in parliament so you can apply for privilege. Uh, Dima is a very good master, so you can learn more of this. The skill is acquired with time, and the flow of wisdom, as you have seen, comes uh, with experience. Mine is to wish you all the best in your exams as you go out uh, to revise. Uh, these notes will be submitted to you. They are also online uh, for purpose of revision. Look at the past papers. Uh, for Dima, we want to wish you good health. And I always look forward to seeing you in other forums. God bless you. Thank you very much. And for Christine, thank you so much uh, for organizing this. God bless. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, everyone. We'll see okay. you next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For class F, we have five minutes break before we start the next lesson. Thank you.